when we're talking about silver being the energy of the moon, I mean, sometimes the moon's out during the day, but technically we associate the moon with the night. Yeah. So the night, that's the time when we're in the darkness, things are hidden typically. It's the realm of the subconscious. Hi, welcome to the GG Bullion Podcast. My name is Len and I'm your host. And today we have on Alex Lozier, who is a silversmith and jewelry artist. Just a quick disclaimer, none of this should be considered financial advice and none of this should be considered an endorsement and nor an invalidation of any spiritual or religious beliefs. With that all out of the way, hi, Alex, and thanks for being on. How are you? Yeah, thank you. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on the podcast today. I'm looking forward to talking about metals and magic and the metaphysical properties. Yeah, this is definitely something that I'm excited to speak about because it's a little outside of my wheelhouse. So um, did you want to just give a quick description to the audience about like kind of what you're all about, what, what do you do and your experience, I guess? Sure. So I'm formally trained as a metalsmith. So I have a degree in crafts. I studied jewelry fabrication in college. So that's what I have my degree in. And um, I also have for a majority of my life, I would say a strong um, interest in mystical practices and ancient wisdom. And so through my jewelry, um, I've been able to weave these two interests together to create magical talismans. And so I help my customers adoring their way through healing, manifesting, and expressing their most authentic self through jewelry. Awesome. And and you have a YouTube channel and website, which should be on the screen right now. Um, I do, so yeah. I, and those will also be linked in the description. So everybody check that out if you are interested. So I guess the first like very basic question I have for you is like what first drew you into precious metals and into silver in particular? Yeah, so it was really interesting for me growing up as a kid because my mom always wore gold and my mom had always wore these giant gold hoops and no offense to my mom, but it was just so not my aesthetic. I was really drawn to silver and I really loved this aesthetic of, of chunky silver jewelry with big stones. And um, although I am formally trained as a silversmith, my true love really is working with stones. And um, I was really drawn to that aesthetic. And I, when I went to art school, originally I thought I was going for graphic design, but I met somebody that was a graphic designer when I was in my um, freshman year where you're just studying foundation. And um, they told me that your entire first year of your graph, graph, excuse me, graphic design major, you just make a font. And I was like, oh my God, that sounds painfully boring. I don't <laughs> think I'll survive it. Yeah. And so um, then uh, at, immediately after that, I met somebody who was studying jewelry and they took me up into the jewelry studio. And I just saw people in there um, wielding torches and working with flame. And I just thought it was so mesmerizing. Yeah, and, the cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I was like, okay, now this is why I'm here, you know, to learn a real craft and a real skill, something that I can't learn at home, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was really drawn to that studio and um, working with fire really spoke to me. And also this idea of being able to mix my art and um, infuse it with my love for stones. Um, so metalsmithing became a really great way for me to kind of bridge those two interests, working with stones and um, making art. Okay, great. And, you know, um, you had mentioned that, you know, you were, you were drawn a lot more to silver rather than to gold. And, you know, although I do love gold, 
I do love, you know, platinum. I like palladium. I like copper. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of all of them, but silver mm -hmm. is my number one. And even as a child, like really as early as I can remember, silver just had, and, you know, as a child, I, at least for me, you know, you think of things in a, in a bit different way where I'm more thinking of the color of it and the aesthetic. Um, but I, I was much, much more dr drawn as early as I can remember to silver rather than to gold. Like, um, why, why do you think that might be that? And I've talked to many other people and almost every person I talk to, um, kind of has a similar experience where it seems like the majority of people seem to kind of prefer silver over gold, at least from a purely, um, I guess, aesthetic perspective. Do you have any like uh, theories as, as to why that may be or, or just personal choice? Or have you met a lot of people where it's the opposite, where they're really into gold and not so much into silver? Like you, you mentioned your mom, like, Mm -hmm. I do think that it is a personal preference mm -hmm. uh, as far as aesthetics. Um, energetically speaking, however, silver is the energy of the moon. And so it's deeply feminine in nature. And so it really speaks to our emotions, our intuition, um, all things feminine, whereas the sun is the masculine energy in terms of metals. And um, it's the energy of the sun, right? So it's constant. And we've heard this analogy of alchemists before um, where they were trying to transmute lead into gold. And really, when we're studying alchemy and magic, um, the true alchemist knows that this is really just a metaphor for trying to turn the density or the lead of the human experience into the gold of spiritual enlightenment. And okay. so, um, you know, silver has its own spiritual properties, um, just like gold is thought of the metal of spiritual enlightenment. Well, silver um, is sort of more connected to the mystical arts and those ancient wisdom um, practices. Um, so that's something that I think that I've definitely been, um, that draws me into the metal of silver particularly. Gotcha. So I, I do want to dig more into the, I guess, more specifics of, you know, like you mentioned, uh, how silver is related to the moon and that it's considered mm -hmm. feminine. Um, gold is related to the sun. And, and I do want to dig into that more a little bit. But first, I'd, I'd like to ask you really quickly, you, you mentioned that you have had um, like an interest in the, uh, I guess, mystical or, or occult aspects of this from a relatively early age. So I'm just curious how that played out and how your, um, I guess, uh, jewelry artistry and silversmithing, how that kind of uh, turned into you crafting these like magic gold talismans. You know, and kind of how that journey went, so to speak. Yeah, it's kind of funny because it's not something I ever really intended to do. It's something that just happened really naturally. And actually, um, my spiritual teacher, she was the one that pointed out to me that, hey, you're already doing this. You know, you need to be talking about it. You need to be talking about your work in this way where you're explaining to people that this is much more than just an accessory. You know, you're working mm -hmm. with magic, you're um, working with crystal energies, people's chakras. There's a deeply spiritual element and my work is it connects with people on a deep level because I think people are really craving a sacred experience. There's really very few things left in our world that are considered to be sacred. And I think people are really wanting to tap into that deeper aspect of themselves and, you know, feel a sense of magic and awe in the world around them. Again, you know, we're living in such, um, 
sometimes feels like apocalyptic times yeah. um, with everything that's going on, you know? So I think people really want to tap back into magic and magic is something that lives in all of us. If we choose to recognize that and um, activate it within our own self. And that's something that, um, you know, I've been able to do within my own life. And now, now that I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, help them um, through this, um, process of adornment, sometimes making custom pieces for people. Um, it's been a really, um, beautiful way to connect with people on a deep spiritual level, because, you know, your body is your most personal sacred space. Um, mm -hmm. and working with jewelry and stones in this alchemical spiritual way, it's a really great way for people to tap into that and experience, a sense of beauty and personal power through it. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I think, especially in like in current year, you know, 2024 and even just throughout, I guess, I mean, there's debate as to are we still in the modern era? Are we fully in postmodernism? But I think there is a, a almost a hunger for for like a spiritual experience or a mystical experience that um, even even in people that would be, you know, the most ardent skeptics, which which I used to be back in the day, a lot more skeptical of these things that I kind of came around. Uh, I, I think there is uh, something to that where there's a big hunger in that or, or hunger towards that. I keep using the, the term hunger for some reason. It just feels right um, towards almost a, a more... I, I don't want to necessarily say simpler, but almost simpler in a way. I would say aligned, an aligned way of living. You know, we yes. want to feel that we have purpose and meaning in our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to, we, again, I just coming back to the sacred, we want to have a sacred experience, you know, mm -hmm. we want to feel that our life has purpose and meaning, and we want to be able to tap into the sacred you know, and a lot of people have lost that inner spark that maybe they feel that they had when they were a child and maybe the, um, you know, the everyday um, experience of going to work or dealing with the kids or, you know, they just kind of get into this like humdrum kind of rhythm of, everyday life and forget that magic exists all the time all around you mm -hmm. and you know it's easy for people to forget you know especially if you're going through um, a hard time um, it's very easy especially again with all the atrocities going on in in today's world to you know to forget that magic is all around us you know and even though I might describe myself as somebody that was like into the mystical arts like from a pretty young age I remember um, some of my first experiences were in middle school when I was 12 my girlfriend and I we used to um, play with a deck of tarot cards and do readings for each other and then in eighth grade we went on a field trip um, to Boston um, because that was the year that 9-11 happened. So the eighth grade field trip for my school was always to New York City, but um, because of 9-11, they chose to take us to Boston and we went on a field trip to the Salem Witch Museum mm -hmm. and the House of Seven Gables. And so that was kind of like my introduction to it. But, you know, then I went on into high school and totally forgot that I was into any of that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until honestly, like much later in my life that I was kind of like, oh yeah, this has kind of like been in me all along, you know, and actually metalsmithing and crystals kind of brought me back to that, back to that, um, that interest of wanting to explore a deeper meaning. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, you know, metals, uh, which, you know, for maybe some people in the audience that don't know this is like, you know, metals are 
made up of a crystalline structure. So it really is all kind of one thing. Um, and, you know, it, even with, with my, with like my customers, for example, cause you know, I, I don't do jewelry, but I make, uh, I guess like hand poured more like kind of art, art bars, that. but I just see, you know, people get so excited when they, when I hand them, especially I do a lot of stuff in the local area and like their eyes light up and it's like, uh, it's almost like in that moment, they're, their day-to-day, -day, like you were talking about, kind of fades away. And that's just in a basic, um, hey, this is some silver. And I, I think there's something to that. Um, but I, I did want to kind of get into, I guess, more of the nitty gritty, I guess. Uh, if Maybe that's not the right way to say it as far as uh, like what, what you do with your craft. I know you said you, you work with your clients to to do things so i guess to to start off could could you kind of describe or define what what like a cult or magic really like means to you or means in general or in your practice sure so a cult is just sort of like this umbrella term for um, studying the mystical arts, if you will. And when we're talking about magic, magic simply is the skill of creating a desired result. It's power of influence through art. And so, you know, the word supernatural it has the word natural in it. So these are natural abilities that are um, taken to a super level, if you will. So these are things that exist within nature already. And really magic is just science that we can't explain yet. But it's really interesting studying magic because what magical and spiritual communities have intuitively known for thousands of years science is just starting to catch up and to be able to prove that I'm going to do air quotes here, prove mm -hmm. that these things have merit, but mm -hmm. you know, all of the witches and wizards and um, all of these people that um, are in these spiritual communities, yogis mm -hmm. um, is another example these are people that have known about a lot of these um, mystical practices for thousands of years, you know? So while science may just be catching up, I mean, this is ancient technology, this is ancient wisdom. And it's something that some people might have more of a natural ability, but everybody can develop these skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard the the term occult i guess described in in a myriad of ways um but looking at the etymology of it it it, it kind of means like hidden knowledge um mm -hmm. would you say that that's kind of accurate like in I, at least in modern society like within the past couple centuries um or, or at oh, least since... sure. i mean you know not too long ago just a you know a couple hundred years ago or and even sooner more modern than that I mean you would be killed for this knowledge yeah it you seems know? like like a lot of what is kind of considered a cult now comes from what would be considered heretical under at least in the Europe in Europe and in Western civilization and Eastern Orthodox civilization would be like heretical under uh, church canon. At least that's kind of my view of it, I guess, or my perception of it. Would you say that that's kind of correct or? That's true. Um, I think there's definitely still underpinnings of that um, in today's society. I mean, granted, you know, I'm a witch on the internet and I do have mm. the freedom to do that. At least, you know, I'm here in the United States. I have the freedom to do that here in other countries. Um, I don't know if that's something that is welcomed or acceptable or maybe not even legal. Yeah. Um, and where in the world you go, I, I don't know. But, um, you know, 
I think that in today's day and age here in this country, I mean, you know, these were things that they were not publicly talked about um, for your own personal protection. And they're still under pinnings of this in society. I mean, this is like a whole other rabbit hole, like we're not going to go down. But, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is like a really great example of it that, you know, um, doctors were made to have anything natural taken out of their practice when the Rockefellers found mm -hmm. out that you could make pharmaceutical drugs out of petrochemicals, you yeah. know? And so we're still living in that dogma of thinking and practice of medicine today. And, you know, so that's something that would affect like more of the herbal green witch community, um, which is not our topic of discussion today. But my point is really that there's, there's still underpinnings of the, the witch trials in society today although you know we have come a long way for sure yeah 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 especially in in the united states and and, and broadly in the west where we have freedom of, of religious thought or spiritual thought and and freedom of speech and and all of that you know there are countries that have uh literally have police and have religious police which that's going down a whole different topic that we won't get into but it is good that we can sit here yeah. and have an um like open and honest conversation about this which i think is great now i did want to ask you because i know we have kind of been talking about um you know kind of how you got into it and you know you had mentioned alignment and i was wondering if you could explain to to me because i i don't know all too much about this stuff um and to the audience about how and you know i i kind of it's like how how does silver quote unquote work or how does it function so to speak from a, a spiritual spiritual or magical perspective like does this have a lot to do with alchemy or like what schools of thought does that come from i'd really like yeah. to hear like uh as in-depth as you can concisely make it i suppose because yeah. it seems like there's very little information out there which is actually how i how i found you by doing my own research on it yeah. so i'm really glad that you agreed to be on yeah, my pleasure. So uh, before we get into the metaphysical properties, I'll just explain um, my way of thinking and how I figure this stuff out um, and what my inquiry of thought is when I'm trying to figure out, well, what are the spiritual metaphysical properties of anything, whether it's silver or crystal or et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, because if I just rattle off some properties to you, um, you could memorize them, but yeah, I wouldn't understand. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But also then what if you want to um, figure out the metaphysical properties of something else, another metal mm -hmm. or yeah. stone, um, you know, so I'm just going to explain the, my methodology of thinking. Um, okay. And I'm looking at these topics. So we'll use silver as our example. But mm -hmm. when I'm looking at um, a material that I'm trying to figure out what the metaphysical properties of it are, one really great way to figure that out is to start with, well, what are its known properties? Right. Like, what do we know about silver? Well, we know it's reflective. Mm -hmm. We know it's a conductor of electricity. Mm -hmm. We know that it tarnishes. Right. Um, what else do we know about it? And purify water and it's used in medicine. You know. Yep. We know that it has antimicrobial properties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so these are things that we know just from our basic everyday interaction with it. We can also look to um, technology industries. Mm -hmm. um, we know that silver is an excellent conductor of electricity. It's used in a lot of like um, electronics. 
Um, so when we're looking for meaning, what a metal properties has or the things that it's used for are really good clues on this path. So when I'm explaining the energy of silver to my clients, like we talked earlier about how silver is the energy of the moon. So in alchemy, the seven personal planets, which are all of the planets, including the sun and the moon and astrology, excluding, um, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. So the seven inner planets, including the sun and the moon, um, they all have a metal that are associated with each planet. And yeah. so the metal for the moon is represented by silver. And part of this identification that is, in my opinion, illustrated very well in the material is that silver is cyclical in nature, just as the moon is cyclical in nature, right? The moon is always on a journey from either dark to light or light to dark. It waxes and wanes between the full moon and the new moon. And silver does the same exact thing. I'm sure um, as somebody that works with silver as well, I'm sure you've noticed that if you leave a piece of high polished silver just sitting out in the open, um, eventually it's going to start to blacken. Yes, from absolutely. From the air. Mm. And so that's an oxidation process. And so the moon goes through this, this process. And like we said, that, that uh, it's a feminine metal. Well, women's bodies are also very tied to the moon. The moon has 28 um, days in its lunar cycle and women's uh, menstrual cycles also follow a 28 day period. The moon has 13 lunations a year and women also have 13 periods a year. So these are things that are these golden threads of truth that weave this wisdom together. And the, the energetic properties are illustrated through these golden threads of truth. This is where we, how we find what the metaphysical properties are. We look to nature and we also look to the uses and the properties that this metal exhibits. What are its behaviors? Um, so um, silver also has um, been used back in the old days as mirrors. So the back of glass would actually have a silver backing on it. And that's what gave the mirror its reflective property. And so witches actually used to use these silver mirrors for something called scrying, which is when they would actually um, look into a reflective surface and see shapes and images um, and that would be like a way of divination, which is sort of like a type of like fortune telling or seeing the future. Okay. Um, and part of that is because silver is very conductive in nature. Um, mm -hmm. Silver is also connected to the third eye, which is your pineal gland. And your pineal gland is where it's your inner eye, right? So it's really like where your, you your get- Your third eye. Yeah, your third eye, exactly. So it's it's your seat of inner wisdom. And it's also a channel for receiving information that is beyond your senses. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that has to do with uh, dreaming as well, correct? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, okay. lucid dreaming, deciphering meanings from your dreams, mm -hmm. um, also journeying, which is a type of active dreaming, um, which mm -hmm. is when you inten intentionally get into an altered state of consciousness. So essentially, you're changing your brain waves to get into that um, same brain wave state that your brain is in while you're dreaming to go in and get information. Yeah, and I, I later in this this uh, discussion, I, I'm going to tell a story uh, involving um, uh, dreaming or, or, I guess, sleep paralysis. 
I'm just going to call it astral projection. I know some people in the audience might roll their eyes at that, but let me tell the story later first. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's very interesting. So it almost seems like these are things that that almost from a, at least the dawn of of agriculture, were, or or e even before that, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, um, that these have been kind of um, just kind of universal human truths that have an association with these metals. Does that sound pretty correct to you based on your um, thought process on it or your knowledge on that? Yeah, I think that, again, you know, if you go back to the alchemical, um, the alchemical metals, each metal is associated with a planet and that comes back to this alchemical principle of as above so below um, which is a famous alchemical saying and basically what this means is that the the microcosm is reflected in the macrocosm or your inner landscape is reflected to you in the outer world that you experience so the path the true path of the alchemist is to transform the inner self to change the world around them. And so this is really what learning about um, these, I'm going to call them earthbound mystical practices. So whether we're talking about crystal healing, working with metals, herbalism, et cetera, um, they're all tied to a planet. So we could talk about like, you know, the astrology of herbs or the astrology of crystals, the astrology of metals. Um, that's that as above, so below property. And really what this is, is it's just information for the alchemists on their spiritual journey, right? Mm -hmm. And that that would be uh, like one of the the hermetic principles correct if my knowledge is is correct on that like of uh, uh, correspondence I I believe mm -hmm. as above so below so does does a lot of it come from uh, I know before we started recording that you said that you're it's kind of eclectic like it comes from a lot of different places but it it all seems to be part of one whole uh, hopefully I'm not misquoting yeah, so I have a wide range of interests and I um, also I also have studied um, at least on a surface level a lot of different medical not medical excuse me mystical not medical mm -hmm. I do not have medical experience um, <laughs> um, different mystical arts and so you know I, I take a very eclectic approach. I would say that primarily, um, you know, my main focus is metalsmithing and jewelry, body adornment, um, and also alternative healing modalities. So when I'm working with the jewelry, I'm also working with people's chakras. So I'm understanding their energy systems um, and what, sort of what energetic um, blockages can happen in those energy systems. I also have studied um, Ayurveda, which is a sister science of yoga. Okay. So yoga, Ayurveda, as well as paganism. And those are kind of like my core um, principles that I work with, like in my daily life, just mm -hmm. as a lifestyle that I live by. Um, I've also studied some astrology, mm -hmm. some herbalism, and to me, some of these um, practices, they all really dovetail into each other really nicely because there's a lot of golden threads of truth that weave them all together. At their core, they're all connected by the body, mm -hmm. alchemy, and this principle of as above, so below. Yeah. 
You, you know, I've noticed several times throughout our, the discussion we've had so far, you've used the term golden threads of truth. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. Um, to me, what that means is that we kind of have to find our own way to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information out there. And I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like, especially in today's day and age, sometimes, especially on social media or, you know, surfing the web, you know, you, you don't know what's true or what's not a lot of the time, right? Like you've yeah. kind of got to find your own way to the truth. And part of what I loved about the ancient wisdom traditions is that, um, they really were able to start weaving these golden threads of truth together, these different um, principles. Mm -hmm. um, for me, when I'm working with this idea of the golden threads of truth in my everyday life or in modern society, I'm gathering bits of information from all aspects. I'm looking at science. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the education that I got um, for my skilled craft as a trades person. I'm looking at the ancient knowledge. I'm looking at um, different spiritual and thought leaders of today. So I'm really trying to gather information from all these different sources. I'm looking at technology. I'm looking at industry. Um, that's for me is a big one. Like when I'm looking at crystal properties or metal properties, mm -hmm. I'm curious. I'm like, well, how do they use this material in an industrial way? And that's something that gives me a lot of information about a metaphysical property or how I can use something in my magical practice. Um, like silver, for example, is a metal that when it's made, um, and this is going to be just like a very, my surface level understanding of how silver forms in the earth, because I'm not a geologist, but yeah. silver is um, a metal that is formed um in the earth's crust with sulfur and sulfur and silver there when these elements are found they're usually through volcanic and hydrothermal um, places in the earth where they're found and in alchemy sulfur is the element or the symbol that represents the soul or the spirit and so you know when we're talking about jewelry silver jewelry and working with it in a spiritual way well in alchemy there's something called the tree of prima so that's essentially the mind body and the soul so i just find it really interesting when we're um looking at you know okay well what are the metaphysical properties of it silver is something that it forms in the earth with the element of sulfur mm -hmm. which in alchemy the sulfur element is the spirit. Do okay. you see what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. you know, so, we have to look at these different um, facets of the thing, right? There's like mm -hmm. the industrial practices, there's the spiritual, there's the, in this case, there's the jewelry, there's the tradesmen's, there, you know, there's all these different facets of information, but the golden the, the golden threads of truth are the things that weave them all together. Okay. So, uh, I mean, let me know. I, I'm going to kind of rephrase what you said just to make sure I understand it. Um, mm -hmm. So basically when you speak of golden threads of truth, it's like you're, you're looking at like modern science, you're looking at uh, folklore and mythology. You're, you're looking yeah. at all of these different, uh, basically every facet of trying to understand something and it's like well this is the same in every single one so that is the golden thread of truth would that be accurate to say yeah yeah it's it's your it's your own directed path of self-inquiry you know like really leaving no stone unturned 
Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, you know, people from whatever tradition or, or beliefs, I think that's something that can be applied uh, and is, is good, in my opinion. Uh, I, you know, I try and look at, I, I try and keep an open mind as, a, as open of a mind as possible to things. And I think that uh, is a very good methodology uh, to kind of see what what is true uh, it, kind of wording it in, a, in an odd way um but i i think that's very interesting of a uh, and a just a helpful concept yeah um, and and i i did want to ask I, i'm sorry go ahead go ahead oh okay <laughs> sorry um so i know earlier you mentioned you know silver and you know we're mainly talking about about silver here um mm -hmm. how you mentioned you know it it has to do with the moon it's feminine and you know both of those things are secular um and that's kind of you know you you had explained that um now with gold you say it, it's related to the sun and that it's masculine can you kind of explain gold a little bit so maybe like sure. kind of compare and contrast those to maybe get a, a better idea talking about the... these gender... yeah yeah and the other thing is when i'm talking about these gendered energies what we're talking about really is that silver is the receptive principle and that gold is the projective, right? Okay. Or that the masculine is the projective. The feminine mm -hmm. is the receptive. The masculine is the projective. So gold, whereas silver is kind of like a pulling in kind of energy. It's that mm -hmm. psychic kind of intuitive feminine energy. Gold mm -hmm. is more projective and it's constant, right? So we know that gold doesn't tarnish. Yes. Um, gold is it's the shining color of the sun and so um i also think it's really interesting um gold being the metal of spiritual enlightenment that they say that gold was formed um before the earth was even created that mm -hmm. it that it was created basically like in the explosion of a star and that there's sort of like this mystery shrouded around, you know, how gold even got to be here. Um, and that's kind of like its own rabbit hole, but. Um, yeah, well, it, you know, it would make sense when I, when I think about it, how I've often heard the expression or, or paraphrasing it. I'm going to paraphrase it. I've heard it said a bunch of different ways where it's like, almost like, silver is the the metal of the the people where where gold is like the the metal of kings right so it, it kind of follows that and and there's you know other metals too like copper and stuff i don't want to go you know we'd be here all day if we go through you know copper lead going through every single uh mm -hmm. like I, I guess base metal um or so to speak um but I, I did want to ask a, a little bit about, um, and, and maybe we can come back to this a little bit, because um, I, I think I, I kind of got um, a decent understanding, uh, especially that, that um, the golden threads of truth and how that kind of um, influences. I, before, I, I did want to talk about folklore, but before we move on to that, I, I was just curious, and if it's like a trade secret, we can just move on. But like, let's say I had a consultation with you and mm -hmm. it's like, hey, I, I would like to, which I may do, by the way. Um, yeah, I'd love to work with you. Like if I wanted a, a piece of silver and like, how, how would you go about that consultation and, and crafting something for like, whatever my specific needs, like, let's say I'm having, I'm kind of overwhelmed. I'm having a lot of things. Like, how would that play out? Sure. So a lot of the time um, people want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one. they want a custom piece and it's because they're mm -hmm. wanting this experience that you're talking about. They want something that is, 
made for them with love, with intention, and that is really going to be a, a piece of jewelry for personal empowerment. And so the first step really is um, the client or the wearer of this mm -hmm. piece really needs to identify what their goals are, what their struggles are, um, what their intention for this piece is. Um, once we figure out what's going on and what direction, what outcome, right? Because essentially we're doing jewelry magic. And remember, mm -hmm. magic is just the skilled, the skill of being able to create a desirable result, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the desired result we're trying to achieve? Well, a really great place to start is the chakras. So, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, you might, you know, need to bring some more grounding in your life. You may be um, overstimulated. You might have too many pokers in the fire, essentially, and like burning the candle at both ends. So it really just depends on what's going on with the client um, and what energy they need to call in. Um, the chakra places are really great, or the, excuse me, the chakra system is a really great place to start because, um, and this, I know this isn't our topic, but just crystal healing 101 for our listeners out there, if no one's um, ever heard about it or knows about it, um, each chakra has a color that it's associated with. And these are the seven energy centers of the body. And in each energy center, so it starts from the root at the base of the spine, then go, which is red, then goes up to the sacral, which is orange, the solar plexus, which is yellow, um, then you have the heart chakra, which is either pink or green, throat, which is blue, third eye, which is indigo, and then you have the crown of the head, which is purple. And each of these energy centers, not only do they have a color that they represent, um, but they also are tied to an organ system and a group of feelings and emotions. So um, if you're feeling a certain way, um, chances are that you could have an energetic blockage in a chakra. And so working with stones because and metals as well um, can help to unblock your chakras or can bring about the desired energetic result that you are looking for bringing more balance, or maybe you need a little bit more energy in your life. Um, maybe you're overstimulated. So each crystal is going to interact with your own personal energy in its own unique individual way. So that's a really great place to start is looking at the person, um, hearing what they have going on in their life, what energetically they're trying to call in, and then working with the chakra system. So not only does the color of the stone resonate with, in general, um, its corresponding color of that chakra, but also where the piece of jewelry is worn on the body. You know, if you're having a throat chakra blockage, um, you may want to wear a necklace. Um, and this is a, kind of like a weird, random fun fact that also came to me um this information actually came to me through a dream which is kind of weird but um women actually if they're which is very common for women to have throat um chakra blockages um for women if they have biologically born women i should preface mm -hmm. um if a woman has a throat chakra blockage, she probably also has a sacral chakra blockage and vice versa because when females are in the womb, when they start out as a little tiny stem cell, the those stem cells actually um, are the same cells that make those two organ systems when a female is developing. And then they eventually split and one becomes the cervix and one becomes the larynx in the woman. And so oh. when you look at the anatomical structure of the larynx and the cervix, anatomically, they look incredibly similar. 
So for women working with a necklace for a throat chakra, it can also actually affect the sacral chakra. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, th that's just one way that we can work with the energy. But um, again, it's so individual. It really yeah. depends on the person. Gotcha. And, and that it sounds like what you were describing there is like almost a call back to that golden golden threads of truth like where, where you're talking yes. about um I, I guess the the biology of it and then the uh like the spiritual aspect of it as well um so that that's interesting i would like to kind of get into the folklore discussion i i know we've been talking for a while about the other stuff um Really quick before we get into folklore, because I, I think it is important to define, and I, maybe I should have asked you this sooner, but um, like for the audience, like could you give like a brief, um, like I guess definition or explanation of what metaphysics are or what, what yeah, basically what metaphysics are or what that means for people in the audience that might be sitting there going like, keep hearing this word I don't know what it means <laughs> I mean to me metaphysical is like beyond the physical it's like the mm -hmm. energetic blueprint of the thing okay. right so there's the physical that's like the matter mm. so everything that is matter also is energy so the meta to me um, and now you're making me curious to like pull up the dictionary and look yeah, up what yeah. that actually means. But um, to me, the meta is the energetic blueprint of the physical. So of the matter. So it's the energetic blueprint of the matter. So it's the meta physical. That's how I look at it. Okay. Yeah. And I, I did, um, I did pull up a random definition just since, since you, uh, had, had brought that up and yeah, this is just from uh, Oxford dictionary, I believe it says metaphysics, mm -hmm. the branch of philosophy that deals with the per first principles of things, including abstract concepts, such as being knowledge, substance, cause, identity, time, and space. So that's from Oxford English Dictionary. But uh, I would like to talk look about... Look up meta, like that, just that prefix. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can do I'm that just right curious. now. Um, so the prefix meta, for coming from the Greek, means after or beyond. Mm -hmm. Or uh, as an adjective, uh, more comprehensive or transcending. Yeah. Yeah, so beyond the physical. Yeah. That's how I would describe so, it, metaphysical. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just thought, like, we've been talking about that a little bit, like, probably should, in case anybody in the audience, unless they haven't pulled up a dictionary already, <laughs> um, just to throw that out there. So I did want to talk about um, silver, and, and I guess gold as well, but, you know, both, but silver, I'm more into silver than, than gold, um, at least when it comes to this stuff. So, you know, in folklore, from what I found from both, I guess more uh, what one may call pagan or, or, or even neo-pagan um, traditions, or even in um, the Christian tradition, um, silver and really like I found in Shinto uh, with Japanese Shinto, uh, some Native American uh, or American Indian, I should say, um, mythology and whatnot. Um, silver is almost always portrayed as a force of good. Like, for example, as a healing metal or the use of a you need a silver bullet to defeat a werewolf um mm -hmm. or or silver is associated with use against demons and other evil forces um and, and you know i do have a few examples you know i i was raised in the the christian tradition and um you know i don't remember where i heard this but uh as far as you know in in the bible uh in the christian bible 
um, you know, uh, Judas essentially sold out Jesus uh, for 30 pieces of silver. And, and I've heard that, oh, the reason why demons don't like silver is because it uh, reminds them of their separation with God and so to speak. So there's a lot of, of stuff like that. And it seems to be in so many different traditions around the globe. So um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just looking for like, as far as folklore, are you pretty well versed on metals and for uh, specifically silver and also gold too? Are you pretty well versed on that or? I don't know how well versed I am, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Like I, I'm just wondering if like there's any um, stories or whatnot, like any anything from mythology that happens to strike a chord with you where you think like oh that might be coming through one of those golden threads of truth like you were talking about or something sure, well, that, that really showcases the metaphysical properties of of the metal yeah well i mean touching on what you just brought up about the story of judas jesus and judas um you know, again, coming back to that alchemical principle that silver is the element of sulfur, which is connected to our soul, our spirit. Mm -hmm. And when, when we're talking about God, I mean, what is God? Like to me, God is the creative life force. It's yeah. the universe. It's the mm -hmm. cosmos. It's you and me. I mean, we are God and God lives in us. And and God is all around us, right? It's like God is the all eternal. Um, you know, do I think that God is a man in a chair up in a cloud somewhere? Like, that's not really how I see it. But um, to me, God is that creative life essence. And so again, like bringing that back to silver, um, that's that alchemical principle of sulfur, which is the soul you know, and the soul is that piece of each and every one of us that is eternal, right? That yeah. each and every one of us that is a fractal of God, that's, you know, what the soul is, or at least how I see it. Yeah. You know, everyone has their own um, way that they view God. Obviously, that's a very vast topic, <laughs> yeah. a lot of opinions out there, and none of them, are, in my opinion, are wrong. Mm -hmm. Um none of them may be right but um to me like you know god is really it's consciousness mm -hmm. you know yeah, you know so that... like, even when we're talking about like well what is life right like there's been a lot of like things in the news i know we talked we weren't sure if we were going to talk about aliens or not but you know it's like <laughs> we're looking for like life or you know we're saying like are there aliens out there there are there aren't well it's like well what is life like is life like some carbon based life form like is you know that that exists in some water-based environment like because that's what we know exists here or is life consciousness like can it be some other totally type of other being that like has some I mean maybe it's not even matter maybe it's you know it could be an orb I don't know yeah, I, I mean, that's definitely a very deep, like, theological rabbit hole we could go down. Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have to take it any further than that, yeah, but yeah. Um, it's just that, you know, um, coming back to the metals, I mean, when we look at silver and gold, they are the male and female principles, right? And we know mm -hmm. that when we bring male and female together, there's a creative life force, there's a mm -hmm. synergy there in between that union, right? And it creates life. And that essentially, um, when we're talking about these metals of silver and gold from an alchemical perspective, that is the higher mind. That is the ascension process. That is the transforming from the base metal of lead, the density of the human experience into the gold of spiritual awakening, right? Become that process of becoming one with God. Yeah. And, you know, in, in folklore, you know, I mentioned the, you know, silver being used to essentially dispel demons or, or, or things that are, are viewed as evil. And I, mm -hmm. I'm going to share an experience in a little bit. I know I've been teasing it for a while. 
uh, but, but, you know, there's other things like, you know, the, the whole werewolf thing, you know, when I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, it, it makes sense that, you know, people had, had seen werewolves as evil. And that's something that like, at least in the Western world, like everybody knows like, oh, werewolf, silver bullet, but it, it obviously has to go deeper than there. And, uh, so I, I, and I, I kind of asked you uh, a little bit before we started recording, like, are you familiar with the story of the, the beast of Javudan? I'm not familiar with that story. Okay, so I will give my, uh, as concise as possible uh, of the story. So in the, uh, in the 1760s in France, uh, following the Seven Years' War, when France was not doing pretty well, there uh, was a former French province uh, called Javudan. And there was a beast. People described it as a beast or like a, a were not necessarily a werewolf, but a, a wolf-like beast. There, there were many descriptions given that, that it was almost like a paranormal thing that would specifically target women and children, uh, not go after livestock. And it got to the point where, uh, and I don't know how much of this, you know, it's a lot of mythology has been built around it. Uh, but it, it came to the point where King Louis in uh, Paris, like he was getting so many letters, he actually sent his, uh, I believe his like personal hunting guide uh, down there to kill the beast. And uh, supposedly, um, you know, this this hunting guide, I can't remember his name. My apologies to this man. Um but he had medallions that were silver medallions of the Virgin Mary. So again, with the Christian tradition and melted them down into bullets and, and used those to try and kill the beast. So I'm wondering if, you know, that's where the werewolf uh, connection came. There's also, you know, the connection with the moon where werewolves are supposed to come out at a full moon. Silver has that connection with the moon. I was just curious what you thought about the, the werewolf thing in general. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely a well known fact that people get a little crazy under the full moon. I mean, this has been oh, yeah. something that has been um, studied. Yeah. Studies have been done, and it's been proven that, you know, um, emergency visit rates go mm -hmm. up, um, more people get arrested. Um, you know, people yeah. higher criminal activity. People are under the influence of the full moon, whether mm -hmm. you want to believe it or not. It pulls on your emotions. Um, as far as the werewolf is concerned, I mean, the way that I've kind of see a werewolf is that, you know, it it it's sort of this like separation of self, right? Like where mm -hmm. the werewolf is the part of the self that has been demonized and suppressed mm -hmm. right so it's sort of this like splitting of like the personality where when under the night of the full moon um mm -hmm. this shadow self you know whether you want to call it an astral projection or you know the an actual beast that comes out but it's this shadow self this dark self um, that the moon is illuminating, that the light of the full moon is illuminating. Um, and so, again, I think that it's really interesting that the silver bullet is also um, the cure or the kill or the medicine, you know? Yeah, I, I think medicine would probably be the the best maybe not the best, but a very good way to describe it. Yeah. I never, you know, until you mentioned that, I, I didn't really, because it is, like, I guess if you think of a werewolf, and I know in some American Indian things, it's also, you need silver, uh, either silver or a bullet or arrowhead dipped in uh, white ash to defeat uh, Wendigo. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the lore around those. Um, so it, it's I'm not but it's but... okay but it, it seems like kind of 
in so many different cultures and folklore and, and mythology that it, it's weird that I never, uh, you know, I kind of thought of it as like, okay, you kill it, but it, it really is until you said healing, it kind of clicked in my mind that it's like, well, that's what it's really doing, I guess, when you look at it that way. Yeah. So that, well, to that's... me, the killing is really not a death process. It's really a process of reintegration, you know? Yes. And like, for me personally, this is like something in my personal belief. Like, I don't really believe in like evil spirits. Like, I don't really okay. practice protection magic because I think a lot of that, even like Satan, Satan was like, a, a construct of the church you know mm -hmm. the image that we know of as satan before it was sort of like bastardized by the church it was the a, a pagan deity that was half man half beast you know yeah and a lot and of what the modern view of satan is or lucifer or the morning star what whatever term one uses i think at least in in modern western thought seems to come and i i could be wrong there could be a lot more influences from uh milton's uh paradise loss i, I don't know if you've ever read that or or no yeah. mm -hmm. Oh, I, I would definitely suggest checking it out. Um, it, it's very interesting. And that, uh, that goes for the audience, too, if you haven't. But it seems like a lot of our um, our modern conception of what what Satan is uh, come comes from that, I guess, epic poem, so to speak. Sorry, yeah. sorry. But uh, I feel like I interrupted you a little bit there. Oh, no, no need to apologize um so but yeah it, I mean my but anyway it just to me it's really just this idea that again like going back to the witch trials it was this idea of the church coming in between your spiritual your spirituality your soul and the divine mm -hmm. whereas the ancient teachings the ancient wisdom and also what I try to do with my clients in my um jewelry magic is to bring back the wisdom that says that your body is your direct line to the divine mm -hmm. you don't need an intermediary yeah you know yeah, yeah. and and i guess i'll i'll tell my my story uh now because yeah, I, I think it's a, right <laughs> i think it's a good time because i know you mentioned um about i guess evil forces and, and how you you know don't really protect uh practice like uh, protection magic so to speak against that um so back back in the day this this is probably going on over 10 years ago i used to and it kind of came out of the blue like i never had it as a child or as a teen it kind of started when I was I don't know my early mid-20s I started getting sleep paralysis which on the one hand you can say everything I'm about to say there's a completely scientific explanation for it but me personally having the experiences I have I'm kind of 50 50 maybe there is both and also there's uh some other other realm that i visited i don't know sure plenty of people are rolling their eyes at that but i initially started having sleep paralysis which for those that don't know is where you're almost in an altered state of consciousness between sleeping and being awake and you get stuck there and uh you know the scientific explanation would be like you're kind of dreaming while awake but paralyzed um, I, I could give a better, I should have written down something, but basically that, that would happen to me. Um, and, and I would get it very badly for, uh, you know, like three nights out of the week and it would just terrify me so much to the point when I would actually wake up from it, I did not want to go back to sleep because I would see what I would describe as, 
you know, like literal demons um, or uh, like in the Slavic tradition, like a like a Baba Yaga or like the old hag type type archetype um, and, and all of that stuff. And, and over time, it, it changed where I was able to almost have an out of body experience where I would be able to not be paralyzed and it was almost like I was tethered to my body, but like my soul left my body and I can feel the eyes rolling in the audience as I'm talking. But I swear like this felt 150% real. Like I was not dreaming. This felt completely real. Um, and over time I was able to, you know, walk around my house and talk to like entities and it was honestly one of the most bizarre you know it happened many times and it took quite a while and and over time things became less hostile and then maybe around 2019 or so I just stopped having it like it went from very terrifying and then over time to more um exploratory and and less hostile and i had recently thought about this not too long ago that it actually coincided with me having <laughs> silver in in my home because <laughs> when it started <laughs> i i didn't really have wow. silver so I, i'm just curious like i'm just throwing that out there i don't know what's i like i said i'm 50 50 maybe it's all a hallucination from sleep paralysis maybe there is something real to it but there is that that correlation there of it kind of flipping to being not terrifying and not hostile and ending with me having silver in the home which I, I thought was pretty interesting. And I had kind of thought about it again, um, you know. Be, be well, I certainly talk. wouldn't wouldn't write it off. Um, I mean, again, remember we talked earlier about how silver is reflective mm. in its properties. And I mean, I think that the darkest, scariest demons are the ones that live within us. Yeah. And so when we face our own shadow again, like, right, like we're coming back to the werewolf, when we face our own shadow and we can go through that reintegration process, that's where the true healing lies, you know, because we're not bastardizing a part of ourself anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not, um, we're not leaving a piece of our soul, you know, to kind of like rot in the shadows, mm -hmm. you know? So it sounds like you could have been resolving some inner trauma or um, maybe even reclaiming a part of yourself that, you know, was abandoned or hurting. Maybe yeah. that's why the dreams yeah. have gotten easier. I mean, I can't say I would, but what I would do is I would definitely start recording all of this and go back over it, you know, when you have dreams and you'll start to notice patterns. Um, and definitely, like, if you notice any recurring dreams, I can usually tell if I have a dream and it feels prophetic. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, maybe most of the members of my audience don't know this. I don't know if I've ever really talked about it publicly, but I, I did get very big and, and still am very big into, um, uh, dream analysis, um, okay. because, you know, you're, that's your unconscious mind, which, you know, your conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg. So there's so, much there to explore and that that's helped me quite a bit um but yeah it, and again silver it's the third eye so you could be pulling information in through your third eye and it could be in sometimes we pull in information into the dream realm because either our conscious mind like it's too big for us to accept or it's it like doesn't make sense 
but that doesn't mean that it's not valid. So that's why it's a really great thing to start recording all these things because it might not make sense now, but it might make sense later. Like that information that I was saying about like the women's um, larynx and cervix being biologically the same organ, um, that information came to me through a dream and I looked it up. Yeah. And it's true. You know, that's really random information to get through a dream except that it had to do with um at the time I was actually um having vocal cord um therapy healing my voice with like a vocal coach I had like a okay. an atrophy in my vocal cord and I had this dream and that information came through and I've gotten all kinds of information through dreams but I would say like record it start recording your dreams, start looking for patterns, um, you know, yeah, and, and, and you know, look it, into it. yeah, it, it's interesting when I, when I kind of gave a very brief description, cause I could go on and on about the experience I've had with the kind of sleep paralysis stuff, but it, it seems so obvious now, but it didn't really click when, when you said like, oh, working through trauma or whatever, not to go, you know, through my whole personal trials and tribulations, but there was a lot of very intense stuff that kind of preceded the, the sleep paralysis starting and the seeing all these terrifying things. And uh, maybe that was my body working, working through it. Um, I, I just find it interesting that, uh, I mean, correlation doesn't equal causation, but having silver in the home, like it seemed like about when that happened is when things kind of flipped positive. So it's just something your inner werewolf coming out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it seems like when we're talking about folklore that it, it, it almost seems like this whole, um, how do I word this? Uh, th this whole kind of general topic all comes back back to like a set of principles, like whether we're, I guess that's the golden thread of truth thing, like where we could be talking about folklore, we could be talking about uh, the sleep paralysis or dreams or really anything. And it kind of has the a same set of principles almost um exactly. would, would that be a fair assessment yeah yeah so you know again going back to the alchemical um seven metals or whether you wanted to look at it astrologically and talk about the planets like you know what i mean it's it's in a way irrelevant mm -hmm. because essentially it's different ways of looking at the same thing right whether you want to look at it through plants or through metals or through crystals or through dreams or through the chakras, right? When we're talking about magic, there's a will and there's a way. There's the, the, the will is your desire to create the desired results or maybe in this case it might just even be to understand the wisdom that your dream is trying to share with you mm -hmm. um but there's different ways there's a multitude of different ways to get to the same truth and this is when all these golden threads get woven together okay. right yeah and then we can start to see a tapestry yeah, that's that's a very interesting concept and and good visual there with the threads and the tapestry uh, that that helps me kind of visualize it. Because um, I, I guess going into this conversation, I I don't know exactly what I was expecting, but I was expecting like each like oh talking about folklore, talking about you know just different things that it would be almost different schools of thought, and it's. Mm -hmm. um it's I guess very illuminating for me as somebody that doesn't really know much about this stuff I'm pretty much learning right now as we record this um that it's all all kind of one thing and there's almost different ways to view it or different paths but it, it's all kind of the same 
thing at its core? It's infinite. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit when, when you say it's infinite, like there's infinite ways to kind of approach it? Yeah, infinite ways to approach it, infinite um, ways to think about it, it infinite. Um, again, it just comes back to the individual inquiry of um, self-study, like mm -hmm. what interests you, you know, following your path of highest excitement following these these little nuggets of wisdom these golden threads of truth like where do they lead you and i think the most important thing is being open to the process of discovery because um not only are you going to learn about the world around you but you're also going to learn about your inner landscape right mm -hmm. and so again it comes back to this path of the alchemist well the the path the true path of the alchemist is to transform the inner landscape to change the world around you, right? Mm -hmm. So when we change ourselves, the world around us changes just by nature of how the universe works, right? Like if everything is consciousness, if we can change our perspective and adapt our way of thinking or our way of being conscious about a certain thing, that's going to change how we perceive the world around us. We're going to have a completely different experience of it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So it, it almost seems like, you know, there, uh, for example, like we're, we're kind of looking through this at silver because, you know, my, my whole thing is about precious metals on here. But I, I think this is a very interesting it, it it almost is, and, and it's maybe because I'm kind of learning about this stuff for the first time and, and trying to understand it, but it almost seems like like silver is, uh, like, let's look at silver as an example, or like it's a, like a conduit almost to do, to accomplish certain things or to help you out or to help you understand yourself, because it's, I guess, part of nature in a way is that correct or am i misunderstanding yeah, I, think I think that's a good way to look at it and you know the other thing is that when we're talking about silver being the energy of the moon i mean sometimes the moon's out during the day but technically we associate the moon with the night yeah. so the night, that's the time when we're in the darkness things are hidden typically it's the realm of the subconscious Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is a deep, deep well. You know, that is infinite. Gotcha. So, you know, I um I I was curious, like for for people that are interested in like learning more about this stuff, whether it's it's the the metals themselves and, and how that relates to it or or just the kind of general concepts that you discussed here um like what is what is a good way for people to to kind of i guess get into that because when i had kind of looked and that's that's how i came across your youtube channel um i i really did not find very much information at all um aside from like a video that that you had made on it and a, a couple random things but it it seems like a very esoteric thing like how would you suggest people that that are interested if they want to kind of learn more about this uh, how to best go about that from somebody going like myself that basically knows very little about it um to kind of kind of learning more about it what's what would you suggest i guess yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, you're right. There, there is a, there is a lot of information, but also you again, it comes back to that um, self directed path of inquiry. So you really kind of have to decide what interests you the most. So I would recommend following your path of most excitement. Like, do you want to start with the folklore? Are you interested in how silvers um, created inside of the earth from a geological perspective. Um, so I would follow what your highest um, 
path of interest and most excitement is I do have a blog as well as a YouTube channel and, you know, part of my, um, brand and also part of my personality is just very educational and, um, also, I like having these really thought-provoking conversations. Um, so you could check out my blog at alexlozier.com. Um, there's a lot of um, articles on there, and I you know, hope to continue to keep publishing articles on these um, esoteric topics, weaving magic and metals and crystal healing and spirituality together on there. Um, but also, I mean, you could start looking up alchemy. Mm. And um, for me, also learning about astrology was a really great way to start weaving these. Um, I like to call them like the earthbound wisdom practices. So crystal healing, um, herbalism, metal smithing, working with the the human physical body and the energetic centers, the chakras, those things that we talked about. Um, those are all earthbound practices. Whereas when we're looking at astrology, astrology is the cosmic and they're very interconnected. And, um, you know, we've talked about how the planets rule, um, different metals, Mm -hmm. um that's also true for plants for crystals for for really anything there's always a cosmic connection so again it's coming back to that alchemical principle of as above so below so i would kind of start there you could get a very um general understanding of alchemy um and you can go as deep into that or not as you would like um i personally haven't studied the hermetic tradition um super deeply i have a general understanding of it for me alchemy it's more about applied practice like once we know these things what do we do with it right like how do we take this wisdom and this knowledge and apply it into our everyday life so that's also again where journaling about these things keeping a record so that you can start to build your own personal symbolism and that's where a lot of the insight comes from when we're on our spiritual path because when we're on a spiritual path essentially and we're talking about changing our inner landscape as an alchemist essentially what we're doing is we're, we're trying to heal the inner self in order to be hopefully on that ascended path of enlightenment right to turn our lead into gold um so you know you can do as much or a little research as you want. But again, it all comes down to what's your highest path of excitement, um, developing your own personal sense of symbolism so that when these things show up in your dreams, you can make sense of it and keep track of it. And also um, being open to what you might discover about yourself and the world and the cosmos around you. That's that's very interesting because, uh, you know, I I guess I had always thought of alchemy in a more um, uh, a more physical sense of like, oh, yeah, trying to to turn lead into gold. But it, it definitely makes a lot more sense as um, like a metaphysical thing or like a metaphorical self-improvement thing, like oh, I'm turning the the lead of my life into gold so I can do what I want in in the world type, type of thing so that's that's very interesting um yeah so yeah and I will definitely link your um uh, your website and it should be on screen right now for anybody that's uh watching and so listening uh website and your Instagram and your YouTube channel um, those should be on screen right now and I'll link those in the description. And I thought we had a very interesting conversation, although like, I don't know much about this and it seems like there's a lot out there, but it almost seems like you can kind of start almost anywhere and kind of find your path through that. I think that what I was missing when I was trying to look into this before is kind of that golden threads of truth concept. And that, oh, that really kind of helped me understand it because it's almost like, okay, there's alchemy, there's all, there's all these different things, 
that in my mind, for whatever reason, and in with the folklore and all, almost seemed like completely separate subjects that were slightly tied together, but it, it seems like they're almost all just different uh, versions of the same thing. Um, it, it, do, totally. Does that sound about correct? Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, I mean, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just saying, like, it, that, that kind of helped me understand it um a, a lot better uh as, as to what it it really is because just kind of uh from a lay perspective on it uh it seems extremely daunting to try and figure this stuff out because you look at, at some of this stuff and it's like oh my god where do i even start with this to to understand this um yeah totally and, I think that's a very helpful concept and I'm really glad you came on. I maybe in the future we can do something again. I, cause it's just a very interesting thing, but there's, and I feel like now I have like a little bit more, like my mind is, is pointed in the right direction for actually understanding this stuff, which is very helpful. And I, hopefully the audience got, got some of that out of it too. Yeah, you know, the thing is that information is all around us all the time. And what do you do with it? You know, it's when we take the information and we're able to apply it into our everyday life and create meaning out of it. That's when information becomes wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's very interesting. So, um, yeah, I, I think we've been going for a good amount of time here. Um so thank you so much for being on. Is there anything that you'd like to add as kind of like a closing statement? Any things you'd like to say? Any things we may have missed or things that I did not ask that you'd like to kind of speak on for a bit? I think we covered a lot. And I think the audience is definitely a lot of nuggets of wisdom and golden yeah. threads of things to follow. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. This is a really fun conversation. And if anyone does want to dive deeper into these topics, you know, feel free to get in touch. Um, I'm here for you. And um, check out my jewelry. You know, I think that jewelry is such a great way to get in touch with your own inner wisdom, um, the wisdom of your body and the magic of your soul. And I'm here to help you integrate that into your everyday life and adorn yourself with a sense of purpose. So um, hopefully some of you will be getting in touch. And yeah, if we do this again, I'm looking forward to the next conversation. Thanks yeah, for having me. Great. All right, thank you so much for being on. So thank you, everybody, for, to listen to the end. I applaud you. If you listen to the end of the podcast, then uh, put, <laughs> in the, put in the comments. Uh, let's see. What, what should they put in the comments? Silver made is. It. I'm sorry. Made it. They made it. Yeah, they, they made it through. <laughs> I, just, I made it through and silver oh. is magic. We're, put that in the comments. I made it through and silver is magic. If you listen to the very end. All right. Thank you so much for having, or thank you so much for being on. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who listened to the end. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.